Well, good morning. Good morning. And grace and peace to you all in the name of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. And welcome this morning to this time of worship. So, oh, there we go. How about that? I won't yell at you now. Um, welcome. Welcome to this time of worship. It is so good to be here with you all who have gathered with us in person. And to those of you who are with us on our, our virtual stream, we are glad that you are with us this morning as well. Uh, what a great day it is for us to be able to come together and to gather in the Lord's house so that we can come together and give praise for all of our many blessings, to enter into God's word together, and to be inspired by the Holy Spirit. You know, I'm very excited about what we have coming up over the next few weeks. Uh, as we've come through October, I think we had a, had a wonderful start to the fall, and of course there was the whole, you know, another wave, but as we're coming down and the numbers are going down, we're starting to see some more vibrancy. Wednesday night was really special, so to all of those who were a part of Trunk or Treat, thank you for putting a trunk together, or for preparing a meal, or for coming out and just enjoying that time. And I think we'll see that, um, that excitement as we move on into November. And there is quite a lot that we have coming up uh, as we come to this time of year. And if you're familiar with the church calendar, you know that we're starting to enter into a more serious time, a more reflective time. And, and that actually begins next week as we will be coming together for All Saints Sunday. So I just wanted to keep that in mind as we come of our Christian year. Um, we, we do so with All Saints Sunday and, and we'll process on and then of course Advent will be coming up. And so if you haven't had the opportunity yet, as you know we like to, we do have a banner and you, you are welcome to add a name to the banner that will be processed in on All Saints Sunday and we'll also have a remembrance, a moment of remembrance as well next Sunday. So just keep that in mind. Um, also, I don't know if y'all are still used to using your watches or not. I've given up on that, and I go with my cell phone, so I just will let my cell phone remind me that, of the time change. But if you don't, if you're still off of your clock, don't forget that we have to fall back next week as well. And then on the 14th of November is Veterans Day. We're going to be honoring our veterans, and we want to make sure that you know that we'll be doing that in service. And then following service, we're going to have a luncheon and. And Melanie, I'm correct in saying that this is a church-wide luncheon. Is that not correct? The 14th is a church-wide luncheon? Yes, yes, it is a church-wide luncheon. Sorry, she was thinking about something else. And we are going to be serving soups on the 14th. And don't think that that's not a big deal because the Nurture Committee just had a soup dinner the other day. And this, these soups are delicious. So on the 14th following service, we'll... We won't just be honoring our veterans in service. We'll be gathering and sharing time with one another as well. Now, to those of you who have participated in United Methodist Women in the past, you know that during the pandemic, we slowed that down. We will be, we have started to bring that back and we want to let everyone know that we are going to be meeting again in November. So we have two circles going. There's the Lola Ford, and that is our morning group that meets at 1030 over in the fellowship hall. And they will be meeting this coming Tuesday, November the 2nd. We also have an evening group. They meet the second Tuesday of every month. So they will be meeting on November the 9th. That's the Canon Price Circle. And they meet at 7 o'clock in the evening. So if you are looking for a way to get involved, um, do know that the United Methodist Women is an opportunity that is available to you. And to those men in our congregation, just know that Cassie Joe and I are still in the process of having conversation about how to relaunch and um, re-engage our United Methodist men and our men as a whole. And finally, I want to let you all know that November is also a special time because that is when we have our stewardship month. And so next week, we'll begin a three-week sermon series that I'm very much excited about called Generation Rising. And if you haven't gotten your newsletter yet, you should be getting it in the mail in the next couple of days. I explain a little bit about what we'll be doing over the next few weeks. 
But by generation rising, I'm not talking about just looking at the youngest of our generations. It's about how we honor all of those who have come before us, how we, at this present moment, are able to live out God's blessings, but also how we are empowering and equipping generations to come. So Generation Rising will be our theme for the month, and I look forward to having that time with you all. And finally, I want to thank Rick. Rick Richardson will be uh, providing us with a message this morning. Um, I was told that Rick had, in the past, whenever he participated in church services, that it was kind of normal for you to come in costume. You've done that in the past? You've come in costume of some sort or worn apparel of some sort? Looking at it. Yeah. <laughs> and so when I was doing my worship planning and saw that we had a Sunday on Halloween, I thought I was teeing them up for a perfect occasion to come in a costume today. Yes. <laughs> I am thankful for Rick. He has is, he is given me the opportunity to spend this past week working on our charge conference paperwork, and so he's put together a special message for us today. So with all that in mind, dear friends, let us direct our hearts and mind toward God as we enter into this time of worship. The opening hymn is 463, Lord speak to me that I may speak in living echoes of that tongue. Speak to me. 463, please stand for the call to worship.
You'll find our congregational call to worship in our insert this morning, if you will read responsibly with me. We are people of God, created in love. We are people of God, determined to love. We love neither from a sense of obligation nor to gain popularity of favor. We choose to love the Lord and love because love is our For the whole law is summed up in a single commandment you shall love your neighbor as yourself. children. Why don't y'all come forward for this morning's children's moment. You're going to gather with Miss Cassie Jo. Good morning. How's everyone doing? Good. Right here. Right here. Well, it is a pleasure and a joy to be with you guys here this morning to worship together as a church family. I do have a few announcements. Um, We need the return Christmas um, child project. I'm probably saying that wrong. The box is back by next week. Um, So if you haven't taken one, there's still a few out there on the table in the main hallway. But we do need those back um, next week so we can make sure they get to where they need to be in time so that these children around our world can have Christmas and share in that joy. But we also have a special announcement that Miss Jenny is going to speak with us for a minute about. The shock on Ross's face was priceless. He didn't know I was talking this morning. Um, Good morning. Good morning. Do y'all know what this is? What is this? It's a It is cranberry sauce, but what's it in? mama she volunteered so miss jenny thank you so much so i wanted to say happy halloween right it's halloween man i feel like i've been doing this for a while it's been a wild week a crazy week a blessed week and i don't know about you but it's been awesome so i'm excited about it but real quickly i want to see who here gets really scared easily like boom oh he jumped who gets scared easily parent you you guys can raise your hand if you get scared Listen, I am the most 
Well, most scaredy cat. I don't know if that's the right grammar, but I get scared so easily, y'all. I get really scared. So don't try, youth and kids, don't try to scare me because I'll probably scare you back, right? But there's times in our life that we get scared, right? Do you guys get scared? We all get scared, right? Do you, can I tell you a secret? When I get scared, guess what I say? Greater is he that is in me. Can we say that together as a congregation? Greater is he that is in me. And I don't know about you guys, but if you really understand that God is in me, and our Lord is strong, he's powerful, and he gives us peace and comfort. So greater is he that is in me. So if you guys get scared, or you have sometimes you get fearful about stuff, remember that, because God lives where? Yes, he lives in our hearts, right? I mean, these kids could probably preach today, right? Well, remember that when you get scared, greater is he that is in me, all right? Let's pray. Father God, thank you so much for this time as a church family and just wonderful things happening here at Duncan. I just pray that we continue to keep our eyes fixed on you, Lord, that we continue to show the example of Christ's love to everyone that we come in contact with so that they can feel that joy. God, thank you for the blessings, the more that come our way in the future. And I'm just so blessed to be a part of this church family. And in it's your name we pray. Amen. Just a reminder, we're going to pick up our kids at the chapel, the front door chapel, when church is over, okay? All right. Let's go. I'd like to invite you all to stand and join me for our Psalter lesson this morning, which we will read responsibly. It's Psalm 146. You'll find that in the hymnal number 858. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, O my soul. Put not your trust in princes and mortals in whom there is no help. Happy are those whose help is in the God of Jacob, who made heaven and earth, the sea and all that is in them. The Lord sets the prisoners free. The Lord lifts up those who are bowed down. The Lord watches over the sojourners. And the whole spirit of the Lord, the Lord brings away the wicked The Lord will reign forever, your God, O Zion, from generation to generation. As we turn now to the Holy Scriptures, we begin this morning by reading from the sixth chapter of Deuteronomy, beginning at the first verse. Now this is the commandment, the statutes and the ordinances that the Lord your God charged me to teach you to observe in the land that you are about to cross into and to occupy so that you and your children and your children's children 
may fear the Lord your God all the days of your life and keep all of his decrees and his commandments that I am commanding you so that your days may be long. Hear therefore, O Israel, and observe them diligently so that it may go well with you and so that you may multiply greatly in a land flowing with milk and honey as the Lord, the God of your ancestors, has promised you. Yes, hear, O Israel, that the Lord is your God, the Lord alone. And you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your might. Keep these words that I am commanding you today in your heart. Recite them to your children and talk about them when you are at home and when you are away. When you lie down and when you rise, bind them as a sign on your hand. Fix them as an emblem on your forehead and write them on the doorpost of your house and on your gates. This is the word of God for us, the people of God. Thanks be to God. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. O most gracious God. As we come to you now in this time of prayer, know that we come with a heart swollen, a heart that has been swollen by your love, a heart that is so full of your love, so full of your grace, so full of your mercy, Lord, that it is just ever growing and swelling. We thank you, O oh God. We thank you that as brothers and sisters who have been united through a shared faith in your son, Jesus Christ, that we can come to this place this morning and that we can just give praise to you for the love that we know, for the love that we know as individuals, but also for the love that we know as a congregation. Why us, God? Who are we? God, who are we to deserve the love that you have willingly bestowed upon us? Lord, we know we haven't deserved it. There's nothing we've done to deserve it, God, and yet you've chosen to love us. We don't know why, but we thank you. Thank you, God, for this love this love that we feel, this love that we know, this love that's all around us and inside of us, that's inspiring us. Thank you. And in all honesty, God, help us from being fools. Help us from, from harming ourselves and others with this love. But rather, let us respect it as we respect you, let us honor it as we honor you, O oh God. I guess what we're praying for is that you would guide us by your Holy Spirit with, with this great responsibility that you've given to us to know your love. That we wouldn't hold it just to ourselves, that we wouldn't store it up for us for later use, but Lord, that we would just live in the midst of its abundance before all people. Because the truth is, we know there are people out there who don't feel loved, God. They don't know their worth in your eyes. They don't realize that you created them perfect. That you created them with purpose. And that they have the potential to do great things in your name. So Lord, use us. Put us in the right place at the right time, with the right words in our mouth, so that we might be able to demonstrate to others the love that you have for them not to make excuses or to make ways just so that people can feel happy about themselves, but so that they can know exactly who you intend for them to be. So Lord, just use this church, use us, this congregation, this body of believers to be a mouthpiece and to be a body in action to serve those around us. Lord, we're also mindful of those individuals who aren't here with us today, those who feel 
a little tired this morning, those who feel weak, those who are overcoming an illness or those who have been battling a disease, those who are sad, depressed, or anxious or otherwise, may they know your favor this morning. And Lord, as we pause now and I invite the congregation, Lord, we just lift up the names of those individuals who are on our heart. You know why, Lord. And we ask that you would hear them. Most gracious God, these are but a few of the names that are on our heart this day. So for those that we've lifted up before you now and for those that have remained unspoken, we pray your grace and mercy. Lord, hear our prayer. For we ask all of these things in the name of your son, Jesus Christ, who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day and give us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil, for thine is the kingdom, power and glory forever. Amen. I invite you now to continue in the spirit of worship through the giving of your tithes and your offerings.
thanks and praise to you alone. In Jesus' name, amen.
gospel lesson comes from Mark chapter 12, verses 28 through 34. Can you guys hear me? Is that better? I didn't want to wear your thing. One of the scribes came near and heard them disputing with one another. And seeing that he answered them well, he asked them, Which commandment is the first of all? Jesus answered, The first is, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind, and with all your strength. The second is this. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. There is no other commandment greater than these. Then the scribe said to him, You are right, teacher. You have truly said that he is one, and besides him there is no other. And to love him with all the heart, and with all the understanding, and with all the strength, and to love one's neighbor as oneself. This is much more important than all whole burnt offerings and sacrifices. When Jesus saw that he answered wisely, he said to him, You are not far from the kingdom of God. After that, no one dared to ask him any question. This is the word of the Lord. You may be seated. I was about eight or nine years old when my very best friend in the whole world moved across town and wound up in a different school district. We would no longer be in the same class or hang out at recess. And although across town wasn't far away at all, we would rarely have sleepovers. My world changed, and I didn't like it one little bit. You have to understand the truly devastating effects his move had on me. Prior to him leaving, I remember countless nights at his house where we studied the force and battled the Empire's X-wing fighter pilots. Gosh, he even had the Millennium Falcon, something I had always wanted but never ever got, and only the people sitting here today who know Star Wars know exactly what I'm talking about. When he came to my house, we defended Castle Grayskull from Skeletor and his evil henchmen using the ferocious Battle Cat, Attack Track, Wind Raider, Battle Ram, and a host of other vehicles and weapons Santa Claus have brought me over the years. Together, we were galactic warriors who fought against all forces of evil to create worlds and galaxies of peace, utopias, if you will. But him living across town now, I knew my Jedi training would be delayed and Castle Grayskull was left vulnerable. Again, my world, my galaxy, had changed. And I didn't like it. At all. Understanding my sadness, my loneliness, our parents did the best they could for a period to make sure we still got together from time to time. Again, he had only moved across town. So sleep, sleepovers weren't impossible, they just couldn't be as often. We tried to make the best. One weekend, after a week of what seemed intense planning, my mom took me across town to spend Friday and Saturday nights with my best friend. I was ecstatic. I hadn't seen him in a while. So my Jedi training would resume, and I brought along my Castle Grayskull and a few He-Man action figures, not dolls, action figures, just in case we needed to reinforce our defenses and talk strategy. I remember we ditched all inside play and decided to head outside to explore his new neighborhood. We ended up having, one of my favorite things, a dirt clog war just outside an apartment complex situated in the center of his neighborhood. Now, how many of you sitting here this morning have ever heard of or taken part in a dirt clog war? Let me see. Raise your hand. Ah, you all know it. For those of you who have no clue of what a dirt clog war is, allow me to explain. Sometimes dirt hardens into clogs that resemble rocks. Only these clogs break apart easily when thrown against a hard surface, surface or <laughs> a fleeing target. 
As a little boy who grew up in Backwoods, Horry County, as you already know from last time I spoke, I learned early on all about dirt clogs and dirt clog wars and shoot. I had won a few of these wars but lost many more. One thing's for certain. If anyone ever declared a dirt clog war on me, I obliged, hurling one clog of dirt after another until we were both sweaty, dirty, and sometimes maybe even a little bloody. You see, inevitably, someone would mistake a true rock for a dirt clog and cause real damage. So there we were, my best friend and me, engaged in a full-on dirt clog war outside this new apartment complex. We were ducking and diving behind bushes and trees while we heard hurled dirt clogs at each other. Remember, we hadn't seen each other in quite a while, so we were making up for lost time and enjoying every second of it. Now, my mom knew that I would probably get into something like this, so she had packed what she called my play clothes, clothes that were old and ratty. She made me promise that if we went outside to play, if we went outside to get in a dirt clog war, I would take off my good clothes and put on my play clothes. No one cared about these play clothes. If they got ripped or too dirty, we'd just throw them out. But if they survived, Mama would wash and save them for, for future outside play. So there I was, fighting my war in my old ratty clothes, determined to come out the victor. Everything was going really well until the war moved into the parking lot around this guy's brand new car. I flung my dirt clog at my friend with precision, nailing him in his right shoulder. He took the hit, stumbled back a bit before returning fire. His clog came right at me. I ducked, and the clog sailed just over my head. It exploded as it hit the ground right beside this guy's brand new car. Suddenly, we heard someone screaming at us, Hey! Get away from my car! I turned to see this man running toward us, red in the face, waving his arms and shouting all kinds of obscenities at us, some of which I had never heard, but <laughs> knew they were bad just the same. What he said next, though, has stuck with me my entire life. Looking at my friend and me, he said, If either of you hit my car, your parents are going to pay. Then he looked directly at me, at me in my ratty old clothes, and said in the meanest, most arrogant tone you can imagine, and looking at how you're dressed, I know your parents can't afford it. You know that saying, sticks and stones may break your bones, but words will never hurt you? It's not true. This man's words hurt and my friend, my very best friend back then, took me by the hand and led me away quietly. When we were out of earshot, I said, what did he mean? These are just my play clothes. My friend just put his arm around me and said, don't listen to him, he don't know nothing. <laughs> then we walked back to his house, cleaned up a bit and resumed our Jedi training in defenses of Gray Skull. It was a nice distraction, but I... I couldn't, and I still can't to this day, get that, get that guy's stinging words and tone out of my mind. They still hurt 35 years later. Jesus said the greatest commandment is to love your neighbor with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. The second greatest commandment, he said, is this. Love your neighbor as yourself. This morning, I'm going to focus on the second great commandment because it's like the first. Matthew's gospel tells us that. Jesus replied, love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. And the second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. All the law and the prophets hang on these two commandments. That's Matthew 22, 22 37 through 40. I would argue that the man in my story, the man who immediately judged me and my parents based on how I was dressed, didn't fully understand how to love his neighbor. My friend, on the other hand, demonstrated perfectly how to love. He grabbed my hand, led me away, put his arm around my shoulders and spoke words of encouragement. No judgment, no pity, just love. 
Thinking about our world today, I fear we have too many people like this man, that old arrogant meanie. But I often wonder, sometimes aloud to anyone who will listen, how much nicer things in this life could be if we all behaved a bit more like my childhood bestie. Connecting with one another, encouraging one another, loving one another as God intended. So I decided to call today's sermon a call to empathy, but I need you to know I didn't come up with that catchy little title on my own. The title actually stems from a conversation I had with my good friend out in Ewing. We were at the Wooden Boat Show a couple weeks ago, so thank you, Alton. i got to give credit where credit's due. Alton mentioned that he really liked the word empathy. <laughs> What's not to like? Empathy is core to good, effective communication. It helps us connect more deeply with one another and has the power to create harmony in relationships, both personally and professionally. So if you're a businessman, it's good for business. But what is empathy exactly? I heard an excellent plain language definition just this week that sums it up nicely. Empathy is looking someone in the eye and truly trying to understand where they're coming from. Said another way, and you've heard this before, it's walking a mile in someone else's shoes. Contrast empathy with sympathy. Empathy is experiencing someone else's feelings, and, coming, and it comes from a German word that means feeling into. Sympathy, on the other hand, is understanding someone suffering from a distance. There's no feeling into or deep emotional connection with the other person. Instead, the term simply conveys pity and sorrow for someone's misfortune. In my view, this word, empathy, and the connection it helps foster fits nicely with our second great commandment from scripture, from scripture. If you can experience another person's feelings with them, then you can communicate more effectively, more passionately, more compassionately, more respectfully. I'm suggesting then that empathizing with someone has the power to help us love our neighbors as we love ourselves. That's pretty cool, I think. So why the title, A Call to Empathy? Good question. The University of Michigan conducted a three decades long study on empathy among college students and found that college kids today are about 40% lower in empathy than their counterparts of 20 or 30 years ago. Now, Holly and I were in school 20 years ago. So, 40% lower. The study cites the following as potential reasons for the decline. Students are exposed to three times the media content of students 20 to 30 years ago, including violent media content, which numbs people to the pain of others. The steady rise of social media leads students today to effectively tune out and ignore other people's problems and emotions when they don't feel like responding. That's a behavior that carries over to their live interactions. And today's hyper-competitive atmosphere and inflated expectations of success have caused students to become more self-involved. They simply, they simply don't have time to worry about anyone but themselves. These attitudes and behaviors have the potential to, flow, to follow these students into the real world, impacting how they communicate with others at home, at work, at the grocery store, at church, any place really. Now, a separate study conducted by Michigan State University shows America is number seven globally when it comes to our empathic concern and the ability to imagine others' points of view. So what's so alarming about being number seven in the world? Well, the researchers who conducted the study cite shifts in our psychological state with Americans focusing more on individual needs and less on our collective needs as a society. Said another way, the data shows we're becoming more selfish, which could cause empathy levels across all ages to dip lower over the next 20 to 50 years. And beyond these studies, there's my own observation. People just seem meaner today. Plain and simple. You don't need a university study to tell you that. 
Maybe I'm wrong, but I see it. Sometimes feel it and sometimes dish it out myself. I don't mean to, but I do. I tell Holly that social media is the cause and it'll be the death of us all. But is that right? I don't know. But blaming a thing rather than people makes me feel better somehow. No one's really that mean, right? Regardless, the data from the studies and my own observations leads me to believe we're living at a time where we need more empathy. Hence, my sermon title, A Call to Empathy. Let's go back to the Michigan, to the Michigan State study for a second. It also showed that countries with higher levels of empathy also have higher levels of collectivism, agreeableness, conscientiousness, self-esteem, emotionality, subjective well-being, and pro-social behavior. In other words, they're just nicer, period. What's also cool is the Michigan State study cited love thy neighbor as thyself as the primary character trait driving empathy. So there's our validation. A call to empathy is a call to love your neighbor as yourself, the second great commandment. I tell you what, I really went down a rabbit hole this week prepping for this morning's sermon. All these nerdy facts on empathy from a few university studies, a video by Brene Brown on empathy and empathetic responses, an online training course. I took an online training course. <laughs> Describing empathy as the core communication factor. All these things got me, <laughs> got me to thinking about a question I read in an article recently on the effects of our national politics on the effects our national politics seem to be having on our churches today. Here's the question. Listen and think about it. How many people look at churches in America these days and see the face of Jesus? It's an important question, so I'm going to repeat it. How many people look at churches in America these days and see the face of Jesus? It's a deep question to contemplate. You may find this interesting, Pastor Ross. I read that approximately, not bringing you into it, but I read that approximately 29% of pastors today are considering leaving the ministry for a variety of reasons, but mostly because people have become such meanies, like the man from my story. Reminds me of that song from The Clash. Maybe you remember, should I stay or should I go now? You remember that song? If that stat is true, it's a sad, oh my gosh, if that stat is true, it's a sad commentary on how far we've fallen as a society. People used to rely on churches and pastors for their moral centers, what's right, what's wrong. Nowadays, nowadays, It seems we lay people know more than our pastors, and if we can't bend our pastors to our way of thinking, then maybe it's time they should just go. So we run them out of Dodge. No wonder a supposed 29% of pastors today are considering a a different leap of faith. So how many people look at churches in America these days and see the face of Jesus? I wonder. With empathy on the decline and selfishness on the rise, I wonder. Go home and turn on your TVs this afternoon. You don't hear people from the pulpit say that too much, I don't think. But go home and turn on your TVs this afternoon and watch the news. I don't care which one. Watch Fox, watch CNN, CNNBC, whatever you want to watch. Just watch one of them. Watch the hate on all of them. Empathy on the decline. 
Selfishness on the rise. I wonder. Seems a good time for some empathy, don't you think? Couldn't hurt. After all, we have a choice. (laughs) Empathy is a choice we can make. We can choose to walk a mile in someone else's shoes, to feel into him or her, and build that deep connection to help that person heal. We can choose to love one another, even our enemies, and be the face of Jesus in this world. We can choose to show mercy to our neighbor and love them as we do ourselves. It's our choice. And if we boldly, I'll say if we courageously choose love, then imagine the impact we can have on life around us. If we courageously choose love, imagine the impact we can have on life around us. To come straight to the point. Oh, skip the section. See, I jumped, got excited. Can you see it? A utopia, almost reflecting the true character of Christ. Here's the true character of Christ love, joy, peace, forbearance, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self control. To come straight to the point. A call to empathy is more than just a title. It's truly a call. It's a plea, really. For us to choose empathy and to love empathy and love to help heal our churches, heal our relationships, heal our communities, heal our nation, and heal our world. It's a call, again, a plea for us to become the face of Jesus to every single person out there. After all, Jesus said, love one another, John 13, 34. It's probably my favorite. It's very simple. Love one another. Love your enemies, Matthew 5, 44. Not so easy, but love your enemies. And from this morning, Mark 12, 31, love your neighbor. So here are some questions for you to consider as as you leave this place today. Will you answer my call to empathy? Will you choose empathy? Will you choose love? What will you do? The choice is very much yours. The ball is very much in your court. What will you do? Amen. Please stand as we recite our fate together, reciting the Apostles' Creed found on page 881 of your hymnal. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day, your insert uh, for today uh, are the words printed for our closing, May the Road Rise to Meet You. Our closing hymn is The Gift of Love, 408. Please. Oh, you are saying. <laughs>
God has come to know the love of God through Jesus the Son. So now may the Spirit be poured out upon all of us gathered here this day, that as we go forth in this world, we might make known that love to others. <laughs>